most of social entrepreneurship has a direct connection with climate change, such as migration, food, mm -hmm. uh, energy, water, education, mm -hmm. everything goes back to climate change. Because if you empower people and you educate people or you give the tools, you help them to have the tools and as well, you learn from their needs, then you start solving the problems of the environment because we're not apart. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sustainable Changemakers, the pioneering podcast on sustainability in the Arab world, broadcasting from Dubai. I'm Nadine Zidani, sustainability and climate activist, a consultant and a coach on a mission to help people and businesses become a force for good. I'm super excited to announce that as of now, the Sustainable Changemakers podcast will be on video. So uh, you will have obviously, you know, always access to the podcast on the usual platforms, the usual podcast platforms, and as well on YouTube as of now. So you just have to look for my name, Nadine Zidani, and you will access all the podcasts. In this new episode, I'm super excited to welcome Monica Fonseca. Monica is an American journalist, a climate activist, a content creator, and an entrepreneur. She lives in between the US and Colombia, where she grew up. Monica defines herself as a social preneur, building bridges, connecting the world to the ones who have no voice and making the world look at what nobody sees. Hi, Monica, and welcome to the Sustainable Changemaker podcast. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we are together, just so you know, and everybody can, can figure out that we're in very different time zones. So it's a pleasure to be with you, Nadine. Yes, absolutely. We made it. <laughs> yeah, we made it. <laughs> I really like your profile, Monica. We met actually at the, the Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week, which happened in January. And I had a pleasure to listen to your keynotes at the Youth for Sustainability Hub. And I was very interested by your profile, especially as a journalist and now more into, you know, content creation, influencer and climate activist. So I really want to start, you know, this podcast by learning more about your story and who you are and how you came to do what you are doing today. Absolutely. Well, um, I was born and raised in a house that was always busy around environmental solutions, literally. So my father moved to the United States when he was like maybe uh, 18 and he studied there. And he was always working in laboratories and creating solutions for problems with water, with energy, since he was very young. So I grew up with that kind of examples. It's kind of normal for me, natural and organic, to understand the environmental issues and world, because it was not something far away from my story. It was always there, very present. We moved back to Colombia, South America. I was raised there because my mother was sick. She got sick. So we moved back to Colombia, South America, Colombia, not Colombia, as some, some people sometimes confuse because that's in British Columbia, in Vancouver, in uh, in Canada, not Colombia. So yeah, we moved back and I grew up in this kind of environment. I was always, Nadine, I was always traveling to the Amazon, to the Orinoquia. I was always visiting local places and understanding there was a huge gap between people that lived in the city from people that live in rural areas. And for many ways, it was better to live in rural areas, but it also sometimes meant poor, you know, misery, mm -hmm. uh, not having resources, uh, not having enough. So my father was always working in those environments and we were helping and we were learning and we were a lot of learning from those regions and territories, a lot of innovation since I was very little. So it's natural. On the other hand, you know, my grandmothers, both of them, one is an educator and the other one, my mother passed away when I was very little, when I was like four years old or less, three and a half. So I grew up and I was raised by two grandmothers and this fantastic father and my grandparents that one was a civil engineer, but he was also into helping my dad uh, building solutions for the environment. 
And my grandmothers were always, since I have memory, working in different fields in social entrepreneurship, working with people on the field, giving them tools so they could grow up their business and strengthen their economy somehow, which you will think it's very complicated, but it's not. And we'll talk about that later. So that's how I was raised. When I was growing up, I always wished, or I thought that I was going to become a biologist, a marine biologist. Mm -hmm. But when the time came, I decided to study political science. And when the time came, I was studying political science, but then I was booked to work on TV and radio. So I started working a lot. I was working since very early in the morning, till night and at the same time going to the university so I stopped several times and then I decided that what I wanted to I, I truly love uh, political science but what I truly loved was to communicate so finally I graduated of uh, mass communications and journalism mm -hmm. and culture politics and and education is my master's degree Oh, wow. And today, what do you do? Because I don't know if you're still, you know, working as a journalist or more now as a content creator. Um, well, I think I think most of the journalists around the world have changed a lot. So content creator has a lot to do with, with being a journalist mm -hmm. because I have that view. Yes, I do work in traditional media, such as a Univision. I do special pieces for them some radio pieces for other colleagues and, and different platforms. I do have a podcast, Mi Sala Es Tu Sala. My, my living room is your living room, something mm -hmm. resembling like Mi Casa Es Tu Casa, which is something that you will hear mostly in Mexico. My house is your house. So I do have that. And I, and I work creating content, of course, when brands ask me to. But I do, I do pieces as a journalist. I write pieces as a journalist when they ask me to. And yeah, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I'm 100% a mother. So I'm always mm -hmm. into motherhood, which is a lot. It takes a lot. And it's beautiful and it needs a lot. It's not mm -hmm. like just, you know, I'm not just complaining and saying like, it takes a lot. It, it is important that it takes a lot because I think there's a key of what we need to do as society to raise our kids better to do better so that's part of my job my profession every <laughs> single day and I'm happy about it <laughs> amazing and, and what's your mission because I guess there is a, com a common ground you know on all the things you're doing and I guess it might be linked to climate change and your role as an activist so how would you define your mission that is a pretty good question that I often revisit Mm -hmm. Because I think it's not just one mission. I think the, the very one mission that we all have is to learn, to discover our own path. So I'm going to tell you something that it's really interesting that we're here now doing this podcast. Five years ago, I was just closing the door into activism and like saying no more. I don't want to be in that spot, but I just want like to relax and just live my life and create content and work with brands and just like yeah, forget about activism, <laughs> but somehow, Nadine, it drags you back. It, it, you know, it calls your door many times. So I think it's part of my mission, which is a beautiful question because of that, because I'm always revisiting the answer. And I'm like, okay, what's my mission? What's my mission? Do I have a mission? Do we really have a mission? And, and I discovered that we do have that mission. I do have a mission, which is to learn my own path. And in order to learn, I just listen to the different messages coming to me. And for some reason, there's always something with diversity, equality, inclusion, knocking at my door. And of course, environment and technology. It's like, mm -hmm. I cannot just shut down the door and say, no, I'm not going to do that. It will come back to me. So I think my mission has to do a lot with communicating, with creating bridges, so mm -hmm. people can understand difficult um, or complex languages. I'm kind of that person that can translate it because I like people to get involved because I, I think 
people should have that tools. And sometimes women, especially, I used to have a, a segment in the university called Las Mujeres También Hablan de Tecnología, women also talk about technology. And it was just like that because it was that moment of the story of technology in the U.S. where men were always more involved and forget about talking about Colombia or South America. And I started like 15 years ago or more now, a segment called Mundo Digital, La Tecnología al Alcance de Su Mano, um, Digital World Technology on the on your hand, on your, yeah, a click of your hand. And I started a show every single day about science, health, and technology. So I think till now that my mission has to do a lot with communicating, but also translating and bringing things on the table that sometimes people think they're complicated and they're not. They're easy, Nadine. They they just need to be spoken in a different language, mm -hmm. translated a little bit, because not everybody has to learn to talk in a tech kind of a language, you know? Mm -hmm. I think the tech has to come and the health and the, you know, and all of that has to come to everybody in a different kind of language. So I think my mission is over there. Yeah. And that's your your power, I would even say, you know, to use your voice and, you know, help, you know, translate those very difficult topics to, to mainstream. And, and what I enjoy about, that. I can feel it, you know, I'm following you on, on socials and I can, you know, feel the, the activism and, you know, the passion. Coming to uh, social entrepreneurship. So how would you explain to um, someone who's not never heard about it, never been involved, you know, in social entrepreneurship. What is it? Well, first of all, I'm going to give you some data that I think it's interesting. Nearly three in 50 U.S. professionals are involved in social startups. And you will say, why? Okay, three in 50, that's something. People are getting there. People are getting interested. 52% of social enterprises grew gross revenue in the last 12 months. 52%. So there's some details, some data that you should be understanding. And when I say you, it's not you, Nadine, because I know you understand this perfectly, but people around there, some other data that is important. Gender gap in business leadership. Listen to this beauty. 55% male in social entrepreneurship, social enterprise, and 45% are women. So it's growing. It's more, you know, mm -hmm. it's more balanced. Interesting. Why? We're going to talk about that in one second. Compare to the commercial enterprise where male are 66% and only 34% female. So if we start to understand that social entrepreneurship is the one or social impact and everything that has to do with that is that enterprise that invest in those that no one believe in, you know, that no one believe can make money or can be profitable or can make profit of their ideas, of their enterprises, little, medium or, or big. And they're so important because we need to include them. And there's a lot of innovation. When you don't have a lot of resources, you think, oh, that's not going to work. But then there's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of ideas and solutions. And once you invest in that, if you're a big brand, if you're a small brand, or just one person that would like to invest in a group of people that you see and you say like, oh my God, I wish they have a better fortune, a better condition, a better whatever. And I think that's really interesting what they're doing. It's not like you are as it used to be before behaving as a philanthropist because it's not giving away money. It's putting money into a good idea, making it make profit, literally, and understanding that we cannot leave behind women. It's impossible. We are half of the world, so we cannot just leave women behind. We need us being part of the solution, being part of the economies, being part of everything. And there's interesting data or data that you can always check of different sources and studies. And um, even from economists, like really uh, important people around the world are always talking about investing in women, investing in local kind of people that are doing things, because then what's going to happen at the end is that that country, that state will move faster. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just like a, 
virtuals. I don't know how to say exactly that word, but I think that's a word. It's something that makes it rounded, you know, circular when you include everybody, but mm -hmm. it translates in profit, which is the most important. And it's something that I'm not just bringing this here and saying like, it will, like a magic trick. No, there's data and there's more and more little banks uh, lending money to little. Um, and when I say little, it's not, I'm, I'm trying to diminish or anything, but you know, someone that needs to buy a cow, for example, and she or he doesn't have the money to. So they go to a traditional bank and the bank will say, well, you don't have the money, but the traditional bank won't even check on them. And there's where technology comes to and blockchain and all of this new technology will advance and give you the tools to understand that if you give that person the money to buy that cow, and that is just a simple, simple example, that person will create its own profit mm -hmm. and will pay the bank back and will have a better life and better condition, not only for he or she, but for his family, which at the end will translate in a country that is having uh, better opportunities. So it is important to bring to the center of the conversation, social entrepreneurship and social impact and social investment. It is important. If we don't talk about that, the gap is going this way. And you know mm -hmm. that, you know that Nadine and everybody knows that. And the, it's going to be unbearable. You, you won't be able to, to close it anymore. So it is a moment to invest in, in social entrepreneurship and profit, you know, and do money with that. Don't think that you're doing a favor. Don't think that you're mm -hmm. not going to get something from there. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to link that to climate change because, you know, we are living, you know, uh, an incredible climate crisis. And again, you know, uh, we talk a lot about climate justice and how can we, you know, more involved underrepresented populations, local communities, and not, you know, um, let down, I would say, part of the world and especially the global south. So how can we make an impact through social entrepreneurship in fighting climate change? Most of social entrepreneurship has a direct connection with climate change, such as migration, food, mm -hmm. uh, energy, water, education, mm -hmm. everything goes back to climate change. Because if you empower people and you educate people or you give the tools, you help them to have the tools and as well, you learn from their needs, then you start solving the problems of the environment because we're not a part. You know, that's something that it's it's curious to me always because I grew up understanding there was an environment and that I was part of the environment. But every year that I work with different people, I kind of see that people don't feel that they're part of the environment, which is kind of crazy because we are there. It's a conversation that we cannot put apart. And people, I have a video uh, that I share with you. Tú no puedes tener una nación próspera, tú no puedes tener un país con un verdadero desarrollo social sostenible si realmente no haces el trabajo de transformación desde la base. Ajá, ¿dónde está? Creo que todavía hay una evidencia mundial que dice que cuando tú inviertes en mujeres y en niños de manera sostenida se dispara el producto interno bruto de una nación quieren ir rápido en desarrollo invierten en niños y en educación cuando vi ese panorama ambientalmente absolutamente destruido y después simplemente te volteas y ves a esos seres supremamente indefensos conviviendo de una manera desorganizada porque no hay de otra en este momento, porque así es como, como la vida se las planteó, como que te, te entra un choque muy fuerte de su realidad. Bueno, no, esto es un desastre, esto es esto, un desastre, esto, esto no es, tiene otra presentación. Esto es, es el desastre lo verde, desastre. es obvio, es decir, sí, es sí, sí, sí. Es excremento. O sea, esto es un desastre absoluto. Voy a decir cómo funciona esto. La basura, <risa> la basura, <risa> para ellos es oro en polvo, mira. Esto era ciénaga donde estamos parados. Entonces, rellenan con basuras, compran su solar, que llaman el solar. ¿Viste? Es que es muy duro. ¿Uno qué hace acá? Muy heavy esto, muy fuerte. ¿Ves? Entonces, la gente rellena con basuras, coge la basura y luego compran un camión de arena o de tierra y 
que es muy barato, y lo ponen encima y ellos viven acá. Acá tengo niñas nuestras. Esto, esto, esto no, no hay derecho. Esto lo vengo viendo 13 años. 13 años. Es esa la sensación que necesito que la gente comprenda. Gente como uno, igualita a uno. Como el hijo de uno, como la mamá de uno, como uno que tiene que vivir entre el excremento, que tiene que vivir entre el popó, para que entienda un poco mejor la gente. Y debería tener las mismas oportunidades que uno. Muy heavy esto. También vamos a visitar no, tremendo, una, a tremendo, una tremendo, tremendo, nuestra. tremendo. It was the moment where I learned that social impact or social entrepreneurship had everything to do with climate change. I knew it from before, but that day I realized that. I, I was like, okay, we need to do something. We were visiting a beautiful place near Cartagena. Cartagena is a well-known city in Colombia, South America, for being very nice uh, to go and party or to a wedding or you know it's it, it's luxury luxurious in in some part of Cartagena but then the poorest people from Colombia are, are also there and we have this beautiful swamps and waters and everything that are already contaminated and you'll say why well most of the people that do not have money will live there they will build their houses there. Don't you think that they're building houses with bricks and stone or whatever? No, they're building a little thing with materials they, they found in the, in the trash. So everything happens there and it becomes like a trashy area. And then those beautiful swamps uh, that have a very important impact in, in the environment and for us because they're purifying uh, the waters, they're purifying the air, they start to just die. And why they die? Because these people, they're in the worst conditions. They're like just throwing away their garbage over there, our garbage, because it's not only theirs, it's our garbage over there. And we're not doing anything about it. You know, we're in the big hotel, in the big house, mm -hmm. having fun, not understanding that maybe the person that is helping you, if they have work, if they have a job, mm -hmm. that person has to go back to that area and yeah you're recycling in your big house in your beautiful house but what's going on there it's something that we need to be aware if we invest in them in order to have better quality of life of course that's going to have a direct impact mm -hmm. in the environment in their surroundings which mm -hmm. at the end of the day are exactly the same surroundings for us you know it's the same water the same plants, the same swamp. We do need to understand that like the connection is there. I heard one of your beautiful uh, podcasts about B Corporation. And I want to read something here because it, it, you know, it ensembles everything. For profit companies, and this is very important for your audience because it's for profit. For profit companies have a social and or environment mission, mission embedded into their business model. These companies measure themselves by a double financial and social or triple, which you talked in your past podcast, financial, social, and environmental. It's super important. Bottom line, some go as far as to write these missions into their legal structure via emerging models like B corporations. So we're walking the walk, you know, we're going towards that place where yeah. social, financial and environment have to go together. Absolutely. I asked you the question because usually when we start talking about climate change, we focus so much on the science and not making the link that you beautifully explained to us right now, which is very frustrating, honestly, for me, because we are just missing part of the picture. And as you said, you know, we are part of the climate. We created actually the crisis that we are living right now. And I think, yeah, linking things together is so, so important. Do you have an example so, so people can kind of connect, uh, you know, social entrepreneurship with a like, concrete example that perhaps, you know, you, a company you collaborate with or an NGO? Yes, I do. I do collaborate with several. I'm going to give you one example, but before that example, I would love to invite your audience to read or to hear one of the most amazing books from this lady named Jacqueline Novogratz. I, we talked before yes. with, with Nadine about her, and I really love Jacqueline Novogratz because I think she really embarks and she really understands what social entrepreneurship means, and she touches 
all the time environment, sometimes not even saying it, but every time the solutions that I see around has to do with that. So I'm going to show you here. So you're going to see her face <laughs> or the book, the book. I want to show you the book that I really love here. So everybody can look for this book uh, or you can listen to it. I really love this manifesto, manifesto for a moral revolution. You're going to sit backwards, of course, because yeah, it's here, yeah, but yeah, I see it. it's purple. She can give you many examples of what is going on in India, mm -hmm. in Latin America. So in Asia, in Middle East, in Latin America, she's always traveling around the world and she has something that she called acumen. Like it's like a bank of solutions and people around the world locally are investing in those solutions and making profit of it, which I think will be the best example. Here in Colombia, and I'm going to talk briefly about here in Colombia. I started working 15, maybe 20 years ago. I was very, very, very young when I started working with them. There's a story behind the story that I told you a few minutes ago when I went to that neighborhood, very poor neighborhood in Cartagena. It is the, the person that created the foundation. The foundation is Juanfe.org. It has the name of a boy. That boy passed away 20 years ago. And this little boy was uh, the boy of a very, very wealthy family. This mother went out for some groceries. And when she came back, the boy had fallen from the ninth floor. Mm -hmm. So she took the little boy, and of course he passed away, but he, she took the little boy to the emergency room. There she found that another woman, but very poor, was with her little boy trying to save his life because of another reason, but she didn't have $10. She didn't have 10 bucks and she didn't have an insurance. She didn't have anything. So she built this foundation around women, about making them having enough money to solve and to move around and to create solutions for themselves and their families, of course. But also, of course, there was a lot of like a health situation and, uh, you know, that has to be corrected. And, and they did because no one should go to a hospital and not be attended, of course. But no one should not have $10 to use in a moment. This woman was very young and she didn't have anything. So nowadays, this foundation works with women that are pregnant, very young, because of many reasons, abuse because they want it, because it was like a mistake or something like that. And we give them skills. We invest them in skills, different kind of skills. Mm -hmm. Who are the ones that gives money so we can work in this? Anybody, you, me, we can give money. And these girls, 86% of these girls will became professionals, technicians, and different in different areas and will go out work and make profit of it and make their environments better. Not only, you know, mm. their family will have the money to do what they need to do, but also they will have education. So this is one example that is beautiful. And of course, there's a lot of examples there of this, of this young women working for different big companies nowadays, or their own companies. One has a, a bread company. And of course, one of the investors was a big brand mm -hmm. and now she's, she's the owner, you know, and she's uh, having some of the other girls working for her and the community is working for her. And, you know, she's making profit for her, for the community, uh, for the neighbors, but also bringing wealth. And she, one of her partners is the big one, you know, the big partner that came and invest in her and it makes not only uh, the foundation proud of it, it makes the community proud of that work, of that investment. And there's a solution there. So it's a tiny thing that will grow, grow, grow. And maybe that girl will have some more uh, bread shops, you know? So it does work. It does work. It's a great example. 
because indeed when you invest in in someone you know you can you empower actually a woman you can you know empower a whole community and, and just by you know example you know because these both communities they need you know examples to look up to so when we see you know this woman you know running a business and making it you know it gives you know some inspiration and a better future and Nadine these women were not used to have money they were used to be given by the husband or by the boyfriend a little bit of money you know to buy the food for the day or something like that they were not even they didn't think about having the money every month that comes from a job or from skill or from something that they it, it's something that you think about it and you say like how come they're so young this is a new world where women go out and work well no when you're in that condition many times you have many many kids some of these girls already at 24 have six kids you know so when they go to the foundation part of the of the mission it's beautiful because it's you can have as many kids as you want but understand that now you're pregnant and now you have to think for two mm -hmm. and maybe for your family too so you can wait a little bit until you have those skills in order to continue growing up you know continue growing professionally continue growing as a as a woman you know because you have to to do so many things and maybe later you can have more kids of course and it has it has worked pretty well for them because it's not the case that women are staying at home just figuring out how to raise kids and how to receive a little bit of money to to make food and that's it but they're understanding that they can be their own, their own boss and mm -hmm. bosses. And, you know, it's beautiful to see them uh, fulfilling their own expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. And you've been quite involved, you know, in that field. How would you advise anyone like, okay, sounds interesting. How can I be more involved, you know, in social entrepreneurship? What can I do as a citizen, you know, whether, you know, I live? When I was traveling to Dubai, I was watching this beautiful homage and the, the story of how they learn to observe. I was very touched and moved with one of the chapters where he was saying, my father taught me to see the animals, to see the desert, and also to observe the people and their behaviors and what they need and what they do and what they want. And I think it's as simple as that, as the message. I wish I can say if it was, we need to listen, we need to hear, we need to observe. It is not just figuring out like, oh, oh, I'm going to this community because I think they're poor or they're, they don't have conditions and I'm going to solve their lives. It's not about that. If you go to a community because you really want to help, even because you want to invest, even because you want to give tools, you need to observe, have a lot of respect for the culture that you are visiting, that you are literally, you know, knocking into their door, opening that door and letting them let you in. That's the first thing. That's the first advice. And it is very important because you cannot just go with solutions as, as you're a big brother or big sister that can, can just solve things when you don't understand their entourage, their situation, their territory. So that's the first thing. Second, it is, it is a good business. Social enterprises offers more opportunities, not only for, for the conflicts or the situations are living in that territory, but like for young people, more and more young people, they need to get involved with those kind of things. They're innovators, they're thinkers, and investing in them, well, you know, it's good for the future. It's as simple as that. It's good for your company. It's good for your brand. It's good for a legacy. But I think a little bit of mix of this and that, you know, observing, respecting, understanding where the needs understanding what's your business and having passion for it. Nadine, you have to have passion. If you don't have to have passion, just forget about it. You mm -hmm. need to have empathy and compassion for yourself and for others, you know, and understanding that it's a learning situation both ways. It's not mm -hmm. you just going to teach something, but learning a lot from that community. Mm -hmm. And I think greater things are, are happening because of this kind of investments. I love what you said about learning and respecting. I think it's it's crucial. 
before even thinking about investing. It's, yeah, it's how do we relate to those communities? And again, it's moving away, as you said, from, you know, the traditional philanthropy to, to kind of more, you know, understand the community and how, you know, you can empower them for a better future. So Monica, I always end the podcast by the same question to my guests. What does it take to become a change maker in our today's world? Nadine, what a diff difficult word, <laughs> uh, question. Okay, what does it take? Passion, respect, mm -hmm. and I think love and compassion for humanity. For oneself, you know, to look inside, it takes a lot of looking inside and understanding what are our superpowers mm -hmm. so we can go out and share those superpowers and really um, make a difference, you know, but it takes compassion. It takes a lot of love. That word that some people don't really understand is the most powerful word, you know, it's, it changed the world, actually. Love changes everything. So it's loving this miracle. We're a miracle. That's another thing. The planet is a miracle. So we all should be change makers in, in little, medium size or bigger size, but we should all be there being mm -hmm. change makers. Yeah, absolutely. We all have this power. Yes. Thank you so much, Monica. It was such Thank a delight you. to have you on my podcast. Monica and I had an amazing conversation around the power of social entrepreneurship and how it can help fight climate change. I hope this episode inspired you to join the Changemakers movement. A special thank you to my guest, Monica, to you for choosing the Sustainable Changemaker podcast and tuning in until the end. Please subscribe, rate and share the podcasts. You can reach out to me from my website, nadinezidani.com and all social media platforms. I will put all the links in the podcast notes. And stay tuned for the next episode.